welcome to the Women of Xbox UK podcast. I am your host, Charlie, from the Xbox UK team, and I'm once again sitting very comfortably and ready to talk to another amazing industry legend. So whether you are watching live on YouTube or listening through one of our many wonderful podcast hubs, then relax, take a breath, and get ready to meet today's guest, Head of Social Good at Xbox, Jen Panatoni. Hello, Jen! Hi, Charlie. How are you? Oh, I am just fine. You are looking phenomenal and I am so excited for our chat today. How are you feeling? Oh, you know, feeling great. Got up super early this morning. Wanted to make sure I'm ready for this. Got my tea. <laughs> I'm ready to go. So for reference, actually, what time is it for you at the moment? It's quarter to five in the afternoon for me. Behind the scenes look at podcasting, everyone. It is 8.45 in the morning, but I was up at six. Oh, now that is preparedness. Right, before we do jump in to more information about you and, and the deeper issues, do you want to give us an elevator pitch on who you are and what you do? I think I can manage. So yeah. my name is Jen Panatoni. I am the head of Xbox Social Good. And that means my team oversees cultural campaign marketing, charity partnerships, charitable fundraisers, and our sustainability marketing. I mean... Wow. Okay, perfect. Definitely going to be spending a lot of time talking about that. But before we go into the role, what I like to do at the start of each podcast is some sort of rapid, quick fire questions to get to know you as a gamer. I don't want you to overthink any of these answers too much. Just the first thing that comes to your head. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. Question number one. What is the first game you ever remember playing? Turtles in Time. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. An immediate answer. Wonderful. And I mean, good memories, bad memories? Excellent memories. <laughs> uh, super good memories. Love that game. Super classic. <laughs> Amazing. No one said that yet. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one. Right. Number two. What is without a doubt the best game you've ever played? Nier Automata. Another immediate answer. I love this. Okay. Why Nier? <laughs> Honestly, if I could choose to have selective amnesia and play a game all over again without having remembered it, it would be Nier Automata. Just the story is amazing. The music is amazing. It made me cry. It made me laugh. Oh, it is so good. So, okay, now, so, so I think so I need good. to go play it then, maybe. I remember starting it and getting really into it, but that was like two or three hours. But the game is huge, right? Massive. And it's amazing. Hmm. I love it. Look, okay. if you have not played it, it is on Game Pass. Oh, amazing. The, the social good you're doing already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question three. What is a game that you love but wish more people had played or even knew about? Oh, man. Probably RimWorld, I'd have to say. Mm. Um, RimWorld, it's a top-down 8-bit uh, the developer doesn't like to call it a game, likes to call it a story engine. Uh -huh. It is uh, absolute shenanigans. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to be talking a little bit more about RimWorld. So we'll move on here to question number four. What's the one game that actually made you rage the hardest? Rage the hardest. Um, I would have to say probably Ori. Oh, Ori. Okay. The game is hard for a platformer. But I mean, the game has been out for four years, so this is not spoilers at this point. If you haven't played it, the game, you know, the Pixar movie Up? Yes. The game pulls an up on you in the first <laughs> 10 minutes. And I remember screaming, crying, like I almost threw my controller in the wall. My my friend Dan was one of the producers. I texted him. I was like, I thought we were friends. How dare you do that? <laughs> yeah, I was uh, like uh, rage in a different way. Rage crying and rage upset that. Yeah. I would have to say that's it. Perfect. Excellent answer. Last question though. What or, or who I should say is your favorite video game character and or villain? I like villains. So put that in there. Oh man, I too like villains, but I don't know that I could pick a favorite not to have kind of a cop out answer. I mm -hmm. have several favorites. Okay. Um, Run through them then. Let's hear some. Oh man. Put me on the spot here. <laughs> so... Um, God, I can't even think of really answer to this. Pause. We may have to redo this question over and over. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have a favorite. I have several favorite villains. Who can I think of that's just a terrible human being? Because I find their stories have more depth, if you will. Okay. Um, oh, God. Panic. 
panic. I'm panicking. I can't think of one off the top of my head. <laughs> I like that you have too many villains that you like, though. That's a great sign. I just find that villains, like, main characters who are good people are always like, oh, we're here to save something. Yeah. And to make a villain, like, think of think of you know, Cersei from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, you feel bad for her. And then, like, you find yourself kind of rooting for her and not because of so much going on. You have to have so much more depth to a villain to make them even more interesting. Otherwise, you're just like... I hate that person. Yeah. I never want to meet that person. Mm -hmm. I do not like this person. So to find that that kind of emotional struggle, I find that that's a more interesting and compelling story. 110%. Like my go-to answer for favorite villain is Handsome Jack from the Borderlands series. And I think they did oh, yeah. such a superb job of building his character and understanding why you can both love and hate him and why he is the villain that he is and not one of the good guys. So yeah, no, I completely understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I'll have to think. I'll be thinking in the back of my mind. I will come up with an answer for this by the time we are done. No, I love the idea. If you just can think of something in 15 minutes time, halfway through a question, you just go, ah, this person from Far Cry 3. I don't know. <laughs> I'll make sure to provide no context. Perfect. No, we'll just leave it to the listeners to decipher that one. So uh, we do have one final question for you. We're actually yeah. asking each of our guests on the podcast to give a guest, well, the next guest, a question. It could be whatever they want, as simple or as complex as they can think of. So our previous guest, Lydia Winters, wanted to ask you, what have you been doing to stay creative in these challenging times? Uh, I go out of my way to make sure I have kind of some recurring meetings on my calendar with people who I used to work with, you know, in the before times in person. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of social good campaigns and a lot of charity campaigns are sometimes kind of what if we did this or what if we went and did this and being only one person in my room like my cat only does so much for me like he, <laughs> he's kind of worthless when it comes to the idea generation part sure. of work. So just making sure I keep contact with those people or making sure I bring in, like I have a meeting with one or two new people a week just to see, you know, hey, what, what ideas do you have? What do you want to work on? What are you passionate about? And let's see if we can make that happen. Mm. I think that's a great idea as well, especially because then, you know, in the after times, let's say the before times and the after times, you, you've got new contacts you can go pick up. And I think it's, there's always something really nice and different about talking to someone IRL and, and digitally. I've since started this role I'm in now since these times. And I'm really looking forward to actually seeing what it's like to work with individuals in a real space. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a great idea and a good tip for anyone listening as well is just keep on talking. We're not just stuck in our houses by ourselves unless you do have a cat, which they do help sometimes. Right occasionally not really i mean he he's scary he like <laughs> jurassic parks open every door in the house <laughs> like i'll be like i just left the door open because it's better that way because if uh -huh. we are on this call uh he will sit at the door and it literally like that scene in jurassic park when the <laughs> raptor's trying to open the door it's like that but all day amazing all day. And i need to see that i need to see that right okay so let's kick things off and i'm gonna completely be like be level with you here i normally like to be very organized when i do these podcasts um but i've heard some pretty wonderful things from other people across the industry and what they have said about you uh and so i kind of want to talk a bit more about the projects you've worked on along the way and as you know we've seen already in this recording some of your positive chaotic energy shine through very naturally so i want to start by talking about your <laughs> career in gaming and how you became mm -hmm. a very avid gamer but i I'm really wondering about the crazy escapades that you got involved with. To begin with, there was something like, I mean, what was it like growing up in your house as a gamer? I, I can imagine, you know, there were some shenanigans. Shenanigans is a word that will come up very frequently in this. So just, <laughs> you know, buckle in, get ready for that. Um, I had an older brother growing okay, up. So it it wasn't necessary. like I didn't really have a choice. Let's be very honest. Uh, the reason my first game was Turtles in Time is because dude needed a play or two. Um, <laughs> and, and pretty much. He, and he would just like, he's like, I need you to go do this. And of course, like I I'm two years younger than him. And I was like, you want me to what? And so it was, 
I mean, it was a lot of really good memories too. Like he and I throughout the years, like we played a lot of video games together. Halo was a big corner store, corner yes. storm, cornerstone yeah. for us. <laughs> um, but I mean, it got to the point like people would buy me dolls of which I was like never really into anyway. And oh. they would be on the roof. He was like, nope, <laughs> I need a player. So I'm like, that's really cool. Thanks, man. Wait, so he would throw your Barbies on the roof to make you play games with him? I mean, maybe he was mad at me for doing something, who knows, but I think <laughs> I think that's what it was. Uh-huh. Like there'd be often times like Mario Party was kind of off limits in the household because that game already ruins friendships. Sure. I mean, it's such a good game, but I am so competitive like um the amount of obscenities that are yelled during a game of Mario Party uh is when you have to live with the person, it's just you can't. Like there's just some games you're like I can't do this. <laughs> no, I'm totally with you. My eight year old plays Mario Party and I have to rein it in around her because if I get shelled at the finish line, I'm I'm very much of the belief that all oh, because she's eight, it doesn't mean I have to let her win. She needs to know that some people will beat her at games and then she beats me and it's just like, mm, no, it's fine. She did win that one. It's all good. So I hey, understand the yeah. competitive siblings, even though she's not my sibling and she's actually my daughter. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I mean, fair is the four letter F word, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you gotta have that taste of reality at some point. <laughs> you need to get that branded right now. You need a copyright on that. Trademark. It needs to be on like Xbox gear or something like that. That's the future, that motto. I love that. <sighs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to unpick a little bit more about when this gaming turned into like a larger interest for you. It was like wh when it became less, you know, my brother needs a player too, and how it piqued your mm -hmm. interest into something that you went, actually, this is a part of my personality. This is the foundation of my being right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, it was a way for me to kind of really interact and get to know people. Like I grew up in a population 8,000 town, which sounds i think at the time i was there was like five thousand, so it wasn't super big and we didn't really leave much uh and i was a junior olympic swimmer so i would like mm -hmm. swim school swim work out eat and basically like pass out and i wanted a social life and it was hard to do like after all that and like the last thing you want to do when you're swimming is like go get ready to go do something because you're just gonna have to like wash your hair and do it all over again the next day. Mm -hmm. And so video games kind of filled a way for me to talk to people, get to know people, and also get to know people outside of where I was. Um, Ultima Online, I would say, was a really big game for me mm -hmm. growing up. Um, I loved it just because, I mean, it's really what you make of it. It's what you want to do with it. It's your experience. And I mean, I have friends from that game that I've never met in real life. And we talk, you know, with some regularity, with some frequency. Um, mm -hmm. One of my best friends from that game actually ended up pursuing game dev. Wow. Over okay. in Chicago. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting to see kind of what video games can create for you. But mm -hmm. um, I just remember growing up, the video games were huge for me in terms of entertainment, passing time, learning. I mean, I maintain that video games make you smarter. I really do. If I you think can they make do it too. through honestly, if you can make it through the water temple in Zelda Ocarina of Time and not like look at a guide or whatever even if you do like that is hard or like Halo on Legendary like you can't just get a casual individual to do like that you have to train and be ready for that your reactions your coordination your pro gamers are all gamers I will say it every day <laughs> mm -hmm. oh yeah it's I mean video gaming is tough it's tough and like hand-eye coordination for like first person shooters, but also like uh, hand-eye coordination for platformers. Again, Ori is difficult, but I love that game because the art, the scenery, like there's just so much to appreciate with video games. Absolutely. And did, did you play with many other people when you were growing up? Like you said, it was a social experience and there was an online element, but were you one of those sort of like uh, the land type players? I had that when I was growing up. We'd all sit around and whilst it wasn't your traditional Halo, I specifically remember sitting in rooms and playing Left 4 Dead, full squads, everyone would bring over all their consoles and then we would just do that for hours. Oh yeah, uh, Halo was definitely that game. And I remember having to like scale my house um, <laughs> because you'd have to connect all of them. Oh, there you go, there's me and uh, Halo. There you are. <laughs> uh, there's me and some of the, the cosplayers for uh, this, the Halo community. Um, that was for one of the charity campaigns, actually. Uh, I'll go into that if, we, Ooh, if okay. we have questions. Yeah, totally. But um, I remember like having to scale my house because you had to connect all the boxes with Ethernet cords. And 
like it was a precarious situation. Like the things, the things we did for gaming at the time. <laughs> Oh, I love these pictures. Yep. Where's, where's this one from? By the way, anyone listening to the audio version of this, if you take this timestamp and head over to YouTube right now, you'll be able to look at all the different pictures we've got of Jen going on here. So what what's this we're looking at now? So this right here, um, kind of a, a mix up. So I've got the Assassin's Creed hidden blade on one arm. I've got uh -huh. a sword from Sea of Thieves in one hand and the Master Chief helmet. This was at GDC. Uh -huh. um, and then at this point, they were just shouting, let's throw as much stuff on top of her as we can. So you've got a rabid, several uh, blow up instruments, a, <laughs> I think a rabid face on top of like several rabbits. Yeah. There, there was just yeah. a, a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you know what? Mentioning all these different games, I feel like we mentioned it in the intro. We, I think we should talk about RimWorld because that's a thing for you, huh? Like you are, you are RimWorld as far as I'm aware. That's what this episode should just be called. <laughs> oh my God, Jen and RimWorld. I actually, um, so I, I volunteer every Saturday at the vaccine center at our um, local NFL stadium. Mm -hmm. And I was describing RimWorld to someone earlier and I had to get someone else like, Hey, can you describe your version of RimWorld? Because I realize mine is a little suspect. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, but RimWorld, oh God, I love that game so much. So it's, what is um, it? So I, I know very surface level, there's someone on my team who I work with at Xbox on who loves it. Um, and mm -hmm. every time I look at it, I just see Prison Architect because it's like a similar sort of design. It might be the same devs. Yep. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. Um, and it, it looks like, like it's a survival post-apocalyptic thing, but that's all the context I have. But hearing you talk about it, it's so much more than that. It can be. It's as much or as little as you want to make it. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I think, mainly modeled after Dwarf Fortress, okay. I believe. If that, I think that's the name of the game. Um, but yeah, kind of the same, same aesthetic of, as you're saying, a prison architect. I don't think Tynan did that. Mm -hmm. But the game, I mean, there's several different modes. There's several different storytelling modes. There's several different difficulty levels. There's one where you can not save. There's one where you just have to kind of muscle through. Um, and one of the main premises, the one I usually play through, is like you have three people and you crash land from space. And the goal is to get back into space. And so you start kind of in like the Stone Age and you have to develop weaponry, uh, food, uh, like ways to make stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then you eventually get to like batteries, power, solar I panels, okay. geothermal energy, all the way up to building a spaceship. Okay. I have never <laughs> built a spaceship because I think that is just so boring. That's um, winning the game. Who wants to do that? Right. And then you can't take the animals with you, which I was like, dude, come on. Like, <laughs> like I would take my dog. Like if I was going back to space, like my dog would come with me. Like that, like where do I file a feature request that I can take my pets with me? <laughs> But, um, and it, there's just, it, I guess the best way to kind of describe it is through the different storytellers. So you have like one who's kind of like, uh, I forget her name, but it's very like, it starts very easy and gets progressively harder and harder and harder. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another one who I don't normally play. And then there's Randy, which I think there's an actual subreddit dedicated to Randy. Amazing. And it's just kind of like, thanks Randy. Um, <laughs> just because his call random Randy. And like you can be in the beginning and it's like, here's a man hunting pack of rhinos and you barely even have a base. So Godspeed with that. <laughs> Good um, luck, here's this scenario. Actually, you know what, pretty you much. Do, you've you given us a screenshot and I wanna, it's, can we get that on now? Cause I'd love for you to tell me what is happening in this. <laughs> Uh, so my, my base was being attacked and you can, like, you can build different weaponry. Like you can have, um, traps where people can walk in and then they get injured. Um, but raiders, they will kill you. And so you have to fight them back. And so I had just developed mortars and, um, sometimes you get drop pods that'll drop off some stuff. And one dropped off an anti-grain warhead. And I was like, I don't know what an anti-grain warhead is. And I was like, it sounds big. Uh -huh. Um, and then I... I had like this many people coming to fight me. I was like, oh my God, I can't fight these people off. I'm going to die. And so <laughs> um, that is the destruction that an anti-grain warhead can do. I really liked this just because of the frowny face. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's sad and I like it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I felt so bad. But I remember looking at that. I was like, oh. Oh, that, that, okay, this has to be something like a nuclear warhead. I get it. Like, uh -huh. that's devastation at its finest. <laughs> 
It looks so fun. I love the way you describe it as well. And and I remember you mentioning when we we've, we've spoken in the past that um your mm -hmm. husband plays as well, but you two have two very different play styles. <laughs> very much. Um. So like as you can see in this screenshot, I like to be in the Arctic or the tundra because it's very 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 difficult. Um. Like you have like have you ever played Frostpunk? You know what? I played it on stream when it first joined Game Pass and I got really, mm -hmm. really into it because I, I was really bad at connecting all the power, I think, was an element to it. And it freaked mm. me out trying to sort that. Yeah, so it's kind of like Frostpunk in that you have to make some real tough decisions. And sometimes it's to the point where like your colonists are basically drawing straws. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I like I love it. It's so exciting. It's, it just keeps me on edge. Uh huh. And then my husband like he'll land in a temperate zone where you can like grow things and it's easy and like you can go hunting. And for me, it's like you have to like you have like trading. You have people raiding you. Like it's tough. Uh, you're lucky if you can get hydroponics or any growing in in time mm -hmm. before you have to start making some real difficult decisions. <laughs> So different to like what I know you and what you do is in your role of like being the queen of positivity and inclusiveness and then when your games you're as you said you people are drawing straws as to whether you'll keep them alive or not it's uh it's definitely different it's a very different um <laughs> I maintain I do not manage people this way so okay. that is good um but yeah it's just it for me it's like it's not anything I encounter during the day right so sure. I'm just like like, how do I do this? Because this is exciting. Um, it's 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 fascinating to me. But yeah, it's um, it's definitely a very interesting game, if you will. And it's just I love the randomness that happens with it. Like I, I brought up the rhinos earlier because mm -hmm. um, up in the Arctic, like, again, there is nothing um, you are like when you have a, a man hunting herd of something, you're like, oh, sweet, that's meat and leather. Like, that's what I need right now. <laughs> And then I remember one time it was like this manhunting group of rhinos and I was like, what? okay, that, okay. I don't think that would happen, but okay. Uh -huh. And it, it's just like random, it's like insert random animal. So sometimes it's sure. like manhunting. I had a manhunting group of squirrels, which actually wiped out a base of mine. <laughs> squirrels, sorry. <laughs> I only had three people at that time. And oh, it's okay. like, man, I do squirrels. It's not like, like oh, you I can had get like this. an entire village and like three really angry squirrels came in. No, uh, numbers were very much switched. Yeah. But um, it was just, there were too many of them. <laughs> but with the rhinos, uh, like they broke through my base and I had like this one and they got in the kitchen and then one of my colonists shot it. Uh -huh. And it just kind of went down. Like it didn't, it didn't die. And I looked at its injuries and I had shot it in the brain and I was like, oh no, I heard it. Oh, I feel no. so bad. And, and so like once it went down, I was like, I sent my doctor over and I, I tried to do what I could. I saved it. And I just, I felt so bad. And I was like, I can't, I was like, I can't kill him. I did this to him. And so oh, Jen. then I started just like, I had a colonist who would just bring hay to the kitchen for like the rest of the game because uh -huh. I was like, I, I was like, I can't send him out. He'll die. I can't, I can't kill him because I feel bad because I did this. Yeah. And so I just, I just had this rhino with a brain injury who lived in my kitchen for the entire game. <laughs> Right. I think that is a perfect segue, you know, into you as an individual and as a human being. <laughs> if you don't mind, we'll, uh, we'll take a little leap there because I want to know a little bit outside of games, you know, who you are as a yeah. person, your personal life, your achievements, um, you know, f feel free to divulge as much information on this as, as you wish. And but I remember you telling me in the past that you're like a four-time cancer survivor. You worked multiple mm -hmm. jobs at college. You took a year mm -hmm. off in between your studies to rescue German shepherds. Like you are just innately a phenomenal human being. I don't know if you want to share what it's like being inside Jen Panatoni's brain for a minute. It's exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank, thank you for the kind words. Um, my, you might have just seen my German shepherd. He the reason I was scooting back is he likes to live underneath my desk. Amazing. Uh, please um, invite got, him for a cameo whenever he's ready. <laughs> he's a real camera shy. He's oh. scared of people, but I will try. He And that's the thing. People think German Shepherds are so angry and then scary. I'm like, no, they're scared. Duh. <laughs> Not scary. Scared. Duh. Duh. <laughs> like this, this hundred pound dog who people like, they'll cross the street when I walk him. Really? Um, 
Oh, hundred percent. Because he, I mean, he's, he's German shepherd. Okay. And I'm like, dude, he, like, he would hide behind me. If you came within like 20 feet of him, it's just so great. Um, but yeah, so me as a person, yes, I have had melanoma four times. Um, everyone should get their skin checked. Mm -hmm. Um, that was definitely, that was kind of a turning stone for my career actually. So I was over, uh, at Amazon and I was on the product safety team, which mm -hmm. was absolutely fascinating. I learned a lot about different types of products all over the world and how some can malfunction. Um, no. <laughs> but but when I was there, I was, and then I also read like some of the most hilarious reviews in my entire life. Like there was, cause my team would look through reviews and there was this product called the banana slicer, which it, it's literally like a piece of plastic that has little things in it. So you can oh, slice that the a one banana you put it in and like you fold it up or is it, you're just a, a press. I've seen multiple banana slicers. It's, I'm sorry. I'm exposing a side of my personality here. <laughs> It's it's the Hutzler H U T Z L E R. That's the brand. It's just a press thing. And okay. then there would be reviews. Someone like I knew the product number because people leave reviews like this murdered my whole family. I'm like, no, it did not murder. Or they're like, my banana slicer face is the wrong way. And I'm like, God, people, please. <laughs> God, sorry, I just caught it. It goes the wrong way. It's it, like doing like long strands of banana, and they're like, oh no, I can't. That's that's too no, visceral for me. No. They just needed to flip their banana. <laughs> and like, they knew what they were doing. They all knew what they were doing. Um, but there's a thing but they right, also with like leaving Amazon reviews on products. So like very famously, isn't it like sugar-free gummy bears is a really fun like Amazon review to go read through if anyone has time, by the way. It was on my desk weekly, <laughs> weekly weekly that product and it says like i made sure i reached out to the retail team i was like can we please put something in the description that lets people know like if you are eating an item that is entirely normally made of sugar <laughs> and it is not made of sugar right now you should expect some side effects like, will, can we please can we please put effects. something <laughs> and they're like it already says may cause intestinal distress and i'm like okay fine like people please just read this before you buy it like i don't if weekly oh my god i'm so sick of that product <laughs> <laughs> right okay before we do dive more into the amazon job because it's really interesting how you got that i do want to mention yeah. very quickly for anyone who is a fan of xbox if you follow any of the xbox fans or channels i should say on social you might have accidentally seen jen along the way and not noticed it now i'm going to set this up and let you explain it by pointing out that apparently you were a classically trained singer for 15 years now how is that relevance to xbox hmm. do you want to tell the good people or oh, should I, I want you to tell me how this came about please <laughs> so i will just say that i had the absolute honor and privilege this holiday to sing a video game and game pass themed opera Amazing. And Let's, uh, should we have a look? Should we have a look? <laughs> Let's do it. All of the Let's do it. Classics in one place for your musical enjoyment. Introducing Wow. That's what I call XGP. Volume one, featuring smash hits <laughs> like so many games. What an amazing yeah. idea to make a video, um, by the way. Fun. And leaving soon. Also, the support <laughs> that you know. Plus, an all new ballad just in time for the holidays. The gift that keeps on giving. Holiday song about to beat you games. We've been adding them all a year long. Oh, let's now go, for three Jen. easy payments. <laughs> Absolutely nothing because it's totally free and also because you don't have to order anything Just head on over to soundcloud.com forward slash Xbox game pass to listen Don't miss out add some XGP cheer to your holiday It's still going My goodness me like that wasn't you weren't even joking around when you turned up to record that right <laughs> i was not i was not well when i was talking to the team so like some of my competition pieces like if you've seen shawshank redemption mm -hmm. um i was always the first soprano on that oh, okay and i hadn't i had god i hadn't practiced in like a year and i was talking to the individual who oversees the the game pass marketing and i was like dude <laughs> i see that you've done some hip-hop songs mm -hmm. which i love if you ever want an opera, 
I will do it. Oh, and wow. he, I didn't hear anything for like two months. And he's like, hey, so remember that time you said you'd sing an opera? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay, here's the lyrics. Here's what we're thinking. Can you do this in a week? And I was like, oh my God, I have no place to record this. And so um, I actually, I used to work with a team when I was in engineering who did like video and voiceover stuff. And I was like, hey, so I have to sing a like a, an opera about video games, mm -hmm. which I was expecting questions. And they're just like, okay, come in next week. They're like, come in on Tuesday. And I'm like, yes, wow. this is so great. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. I mean, and the, the results speak for themselves. Like that was, that was so good. Very, very impressive. And continuing the theme of impressive, we are now going to move on. And this is where we go into your actual career and the roles that you've done. So we mentioned that uh, you did go to college. You studied linguistics, mm -hmm. which by the way, I studied mm -hmm. English language as well. Best subject ever to study. I absolutely adored it. But your first yeah. role when you came into gaming was actually on the policy and enforcement team back before mm -hmm. it was the Xbox safety. So do you want to maybe talk a little bit? I think every single person who plays Xbox knows in some capacity this team, but do you want to shed some light on actually what you do maybe behind the scenes and what it meant to be a part of that team? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was fascinating. I will say that mm -hmm. it is probably one of the most passionate teams in the business because everybody I worked with genuinely cared about making the platform a safer place. Mm -hmm. and. You know, just to give you some insight, um, imagine a word, usually four letters long, yeah. that you usually say in kind of like familiar company, right? Yeah. Um, usually not in front of like your grandparents or people you respect. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and now imagine that you are the team that has to kind of dictate what is an acceptable use of this word. When is this word okay? Mm -hmm. Is it ever okay? Is it not okay? Is it good in this capacity? Is it good in this context? And imagine that those meetings tend to go for a few hours. Um, Sounds just like to, kind of meetings so I like. <laughs> they were hilarious. I love them. Uh, but there was also, it was just, there are some circumstances in which you have to figure out, you know, what are edge cases? You know, in engineering, there's always edge cases, but here mm -hmm. there's definitely always edge cases and context is king and it's crucial. And so it was just fascinating to be, you know, working on the team that did that. I originally started as a, a business analyst and then I moved into a technical program manager role uh -huh. working on features um just to kind of like for our team to enforce on stuff as they would roll out across the platform mm -hmm. perfect it sounds it sounds really sort of i mean to talk more about the linguistic side of it was that something that you felt aside from these very specific four letter words that would crop up is that something you felt was really important and that was you were sort of glad you trained in going into it or was it more just a common sense of like you're barred you're fine but i'm going to give you a warning that that sort of dynamic Sometimes it did come down to that. Like sometimes I was drawing syntax trees on the whiteboard and then okay. sometimes it was just like, you, you can't say that. Like there's, there are zero circumstances under which that is okay. So it, it was kind of a mix of both, to be honest. Yeah. And then, I mean, I sort of, without jumping too far ahead and going to your current role, I, I mean, there must be some sort of like equality between protecting and nurturing a community back on the enforcement team, but then also wanting to respectfully represent that same community nowadays with your current role. Is this is this something you felt you've always wanted to do in games? You mean um, working on social good and all that stuff? I mean, yeah, what I just saw. like sh showing the best <laughs> side of people, you know? Mm -hmm. When I was over on the enforcement team, one thing that we would continually see and I would see time and time again was that the community really wanted to be stewards of their own community. Mm -hmm. There was a majority of people who really wanted to lean in and they wanted to help and they want to make gaming a safe place for everyone and a place where everyone belongs. And, you know, I loved seeing that. And that's really why I created this role out of engineering. I, I saw that and I was like, listen, we have an opportunity here to really nurture this passion and this this um, this want to go make the world a better place, and yeah. we don't have to do it alone. We can leverage the gaming community. Yeah, you know what? Um, let's move on to that now because I want to pick apart what you've essentially just said, which is that you, in essence, created the role that you're in. So I'd love to know more about the mindset of you know 
figuring out that this role needs to exist and the process of actually creating it. Because I think for a lot of people listening, regardless of whether they're in the games industry or not, I think the idea of making your own role and someone buying into that and letting you, you know, commandeer your dream job is something everyone would love to do at some point. Absolutely. Um, when I, you know, I was on the policy and enforcement team and I kept seeing this opportunity. And so what I did is I put together kind of a pilot program in my mind of, you know, it, it honestly started with charity programs first okay. before it started including sustainability and cultural campaigns. Um, and it started, we have this internal program at Microsoft called the Give Campaign in mm -hmm. October, where you can basically like you get to donate to charities, host events year round or in the month of October. Um, usually we'll have events like when we can all be in person, um, we will actually have like blanket making events where we get felt okay. and like tie them together. And we bring a kitten or a dog on site for QA because you obviously have to have QA. Obviously. And um, we like, there's an events like that. And I remember um, I took this tournament that had been happening for like 14 years at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was a guy named Carl who was driving it, who's probably one of the most wholesome human beings on the planet. And usually it was kind of in like the back user research lab. And I was like, hey, what if we do an esports tournament? Because selfishly, I love esports. I think it's so amazing. The fact that you can sell out arenas for video games, like, moves my heart muscle so much. And it's something so that didn't much. exist years ago. And I think it's it's sort of, I mean, to interject slightly, it's one of the things that I reinforce constantly to members of my friends and family who are constantly like, yep. sort of undermining games impact. And it's like, well, look right. at how many people are in this stadium watching these people at the top of their game winning millions. And I think it's it's the easiest way right. to sort of enforce how, how huge gaming has become. Absolutely, absolutely. And what we did with this event was we turned like the, the atrium of our building into an esports arena. Like we stayed over the weekend, we planned it over a week, or we planned it over a month, um, which usually these things take way longer than that. I was gonna and, say, that's not long. <laughs> yeah, no, I once had someone, best of intentions, he, he'd been at the company for like 20, 25 years. He pulls me into his office, he's like, do you have any idea what you're doing? I was like, absolutely not. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I have 20 people who are gonna help me figure this out. Uh -huh. Which, you know, having a team, I think is probably the best thing. This is the best advice I can give anyone. Make sure you have a team who supports and believes in the mission that you do, because you can create, I have lots of stories on how you can create absolute magic with that. So we did that and I was like, I want to do this full time. Like, this is amazing. Like mm -hmm. we raised, I think over, I don't know if it was a hundred thousand for charity, but it was a substantial amount. Wow. And so what we did is I was talking, like I made this kind of pilot program of like, okay, if Xbox did this at the Xbox level, mm -hmm. here's what it would look like. Here are some principles we believe in. Here's what we do. And I went to, oh my goodness, 20 GM level and above people. I'm like, hey, wow. we should go do this. And they're like, this is really cool, but you know, I'm outside of budget season or I didn't plan for this or I don't have a headcount for this because you know, they have actual teams and programs that they're running. Mm -hmm. And so I finally went to my own CVP at the time, Dave, and I was like, hey, Dave, I have this idea. I think it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Here's the impact it could have. What do you think? And it was really focused on esports at the time. And he's like, I think that's a way not the way and so we kind of went back and forth and over a week um after a week he's like yeah let's go do this wow and i i was not expecting anyone to say yes um but i'm so thankful that he did i mean it led to ultimately where i am now the impact that xbox and our gaming community has created mm -hmm. Goodness, over the last two, two and a half years. And it's not that Xbox, this isn't the first time Xbox has done social good. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, working with the teams who are providing these opportunities, giving them frameworks, playbooks, how to's, because sometimes doing these types of events can be really intimidating. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, with everything that's going on with people all over the world and Xbox being a global community, I know I've certainly seen a lot of uh, gamers, you know, utilize, sorry, utilizing their time at home and their communities and their friends and family to do their own mini social good and, and raising money for things and like putting on little fundraisers and stuff. So, you know, I, I mm -hmm. imagine that goes hand in hand with the work that you do and, you know, showing good old Dave out there that this actually exists and gamers are passionate about that. Mm hmm. It's honestly, I, I like to joke that I have the most wholesome uh, job at Xbox, but I honestly do believe that. And 
I love the work that this team does because it's not my team driving everything. We can't. With a global company, we don't scale it that way. Sure. But we work with different teams across the globe to go do social good stuff. And we've had, you know, we can go into more detail later, but raising either a million dollars for coronavirus relief or getting hundreds of thousands of people to donate blood during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's it's amazing the impact that you can have when you work with different video games and different platforms. I love it. I love it, love it. Amazing. So should we talk about the very first project that you ever did? I'm I won't do any intro to this because this is this is all you. I want your passion to come through. But the first thing you worked on was the Special Olympics. So what was that and what was it that you did? It was pure magic. I <laughs> love this tournament so much. Um what it was, what it started from a hackathon um, from this woman named Karen and her husband, Steven. And they, Microsoft has a hackathon every year. You can go quit your quit your day job for a week and go work on a passion project. Oh, and they're okay. like, hey, what if we brought esports to the Special Olympics? Uh -huh. And they laid out what that would look like, um, just kind of at a high level concept. And then uh, probably four or five months later, I was brought in and they're like, hey, we have a partnership with the Special Olympics. Um, Microsoft is based in Redmond. And University of Washington is just over Lake Washington and the USA games were happening at the University of Washington, which mm -hmm. is where I went to school. And um, they're like, hey, what if we did an esports tournament at the Special Olympics? Like, can we pull that off? And I'm like, it's March. And that happens in the first week of July. <laughs> and and they're like, yeah, but we can do it, right? I was like, yeah, we can absolutely do it. Yes, go for it. Of course. And so again, it was the same kind of pull in the same people um, that I worked with for the last tournament and bring in some new like external producing teams who were working on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was really kind of fun because we actually had l national prelims. And so what we did when the Microsoft stores were still physical stores, we invited different Special Olympics chapters to the different stores to go hold prelims because they that's something oh, they did awesome. all the time is hold uh -huh. esports stuff. Yeah, absolutely except for Connecticut, for some reason, they couldn't actually go to the store. And so the stores folks, bless their souls, packed up all their stuff and went to the school. Oh, I love the special that, Olympics athletes were commitment. At. <laughs> it was, oh, I, I cried so many happy tears during this whole process. Um, but so we had five states that were competing. And so we flew out the winner from each state and then the next fastest three times. So we had eight people compete. And we, we flew them here. We got them esports jerseys. They mm -hmm. looked so cool because everyone else had kind of like, like traditional sports had like polos and khakis. And we we're like, no, we're going to give you like Meta Threads jerseys. Like these are legit, super awesome jerseys. And they wore them like the whole week. Um, wow. But we had this like event, you know, we didn't want to do something super, super, super intense. Right. And so it was kind of a it was a smaller but high quality tournament mm -hmm. and it was so fun. Um, we even had our shoutcasters. We had an interpreter right next to him. And I remember the shoutcasters being like, I've never had an interpreter. This is so cool. I love it. I mean, we do actually have a video. So should we pipe down a second and let your amazing work speak for itself? Uh, take a look at this video of how amazing Jen's work was at the Special Olympics. We are right now at the University of Washington campus for the first ever gaming tournament at the USA Special Olympics Games. There are more than 4,000 athletes and coaches here supported by 50 different state and local programs. Esports, competitive gaming, gaming is such a big deal around the world. Why include it in this year's USA Games? Because we're about revolutionary thinking, and revolutionary thinking means we have to break down barriers, and breaking down barriers means we have to find every available opportunity for people to play and compete. Kevin's actually going to take the lead here. This is going to come down to the wire to determine who our top finishers will be. A lot of people think that Special Olympics isn't yeah. about competition, and they're showing today that they're ready to compete. We have brought Special Olympics and Xbox together to do something that has never been done before that will change the course of history going forward. We really want to empower all gamers to play and to compete in the way that they want to. And so by bringing a gaming tournament to the Special Olympics, we really hope that that sends the message to all gamers that the joy of competition is yours on a big stage. The prize is two custom-made 
consoles. It says Rise With Us, which is the Special Olympics tagline and the Special Olympics logo on top. First place, drum roll. <laughs> Team Dempsey, Nicholas and Tim. Come on stage, Tim, come on stage, guys. What on earth was it like for you down there? Speechless. <laughs> <laughs> My heart's just warm. You get to do this for a living. And like, I mean, you know what? We'll even bounce off one of the events you've just mentioned previously, the blood drive that you did. This was a state of decay, social good moment mm -hmm. that you did. Can you tell us a bit more information about that one? Yeah, but one thing I do want to touch on is that last frame in that video. That was the entire team that pulled that whole project together. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention all of those people and give all of the credit where credit is due like i am lucky i am fortunate i am blessed to be able to represent the work that they do mm -hmm. but i would be nowhere without them so my deepest thanks and gratitude got to every single person who works on these projects and different groundbreaking moments but blood drive blood drive so this is yes. a this is a fun one um what we did in the beginning of the pandemic um well, lots of things in the beginning of the pandemic, but <laughs> blood drives and blood stores were critical. Uh -huh. They were actually on the verge of collapse nationwide. Worldwide, probably, but nationwide for sure. And we we have conversations with the Red, Clock, Red Cross a lot. And what we ended up doing is we, we, um, we talked to Undead Labs, who does a lot of social good. Mm -hmm. I love the work that they do. Um, but they wanted to do kind of a fundraiser for the Red Cross, but with uh, manufacturing times and shipping times all kind of being brought to a halt uh, because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, there's not, there's not much we can do for a fundraising here. So what we'll do is we'll do an awareness campaign. And with the Red Cross, they're like, hey, like blood stores are critical. And we're like, okay, why don't we go encourage people to donate blood? And one of the first things that myself and Wonder, who she's the, she's the person who oversees kind of social good at Undead Labs, mm -hmm. and she's their comms director, we both went and donated blood first. I hadn't donated blood in 14 years. And I was like, you know, I'm literally not going to ask someone to go do something that I want. I was going to gonna say like that. I think that is a hugely important thing to call out. It's like sort of practicing what you're preaching and not just saying what needs to be done for the sake of saying it, but also living that truth as well. And I just I want to call out specifically that I love that you did that. Thank you. Yeah, it was I just I had always for some reason, some doctor once had told me like, oh, you shouldn't go donate blood. And I was like, okay. And then <laughs> <Not> once, <laughs> right. And then once hearing that blood stores were critical, I was like, I mean, I can make more blood. I'll just mm -hmm. give someone my blood. And um, it's really, it's, it's a rewarding feeling, honestly. It doesn't take that long. It's not that scary. If you're afraid of needles, just look the other way. Like it's, it's totally fine. But we went and donated blood. Neither of us got COVID. It was very safe. I got to observe the practices that the Red Cross was putting in. Mm -hmm. And then uh, myself and Wonder and uh, a member of the Red Cross were actually on their live stream okay. that following Monday. And we were talking about, you know, Wonder and I were talking about our experiences. Um, the Red Cross individuals talking about the different practices they had or how giving blood was important. And in the game, they actually put this this um sorry i'm looking at it over here because i love this thing so much <laughs> they put a blood mobile in the game just uh -huh. to remind people to go donate and it's it's basically an ambulance they have skinned it red it's got a droplet on the side and it says give blood underneath mm -hmm. and it is covered in blood <laughs> like imagine you have run over at least 50 zombies at <laughs> least 50. <laughs> And I As remember standard for the game anyway. That's my experience of playing right. Stay the Gay. <laughs> right. Like it, it's normal for the game, but I remember Absolutely. looking at this and look talking to the Undead Labs team, being like, guys, there's no way Red Cross is gonna sign off on this. <laughs> and they're like, we're just gonna try it. We're just gonna try it. And I'm like, okay, like that I will be shocked, but okay. Mm -hmm. And I remember we took it to we took it to Red Cross, and the only feedback they had, they were like, can you just like take the blood off the windshield? I feel like that's a safety <laughs> hazard. <laughs> but they were and, all in uh, for the rest of it. That's brilliant. I love it. All in, all in, all in. Um, There's like blood in the treads. Like they were really thorough with which, where they went and put this. So if you go on Twitter, 
Um, we still are encouraging people to go donate blood, mm -hmm. right? So if you go to Twitter and go to hashtag SOD2 blood drive, you can see photos of people who have donated blood. Uh, you have photos of the wonderful in-game asset, uh, the blood mobile, and just people sharing their stories of how they wanted to contribute. That's amazing. And I think that's, again, calling back on, on stuff you mentioned earlier about gamers wanting to be the stewards, right? And they, they want to help and in doing things in game, like I believe State of Decay also did something for Black History Month last year as well. Mm -hmm. like seeing companies, uh, Sea of Thieves is phenomenal for this as well, like creating sales that directly have the sales of those sales go towards charities. Right. It's just like, it's, it's just, it's a no brainer at how easy it is to give back to charities just by playing games. And here I'm going to reiterate, if there's anyone listening who doesn't know, and this is my day job coming through, if you are a, a regular Xbox player, make sure you're looking at charities you can spend your Microsoft reward points on. They rotate on a monthly basis and you can give to any number of amazing charities. So please just, just do so. But at this point, I'm actually going to start rounding things back over to you personally, Jen. Uh, with this being mm -hmm. the Women of Xbox UK podcast, I want to touch on your unique position as a woman in gaming uh, mm -hmm. and, and in the industry and what you think it's, it takes to reach a stage that you're at, but also stepping into the industry. Because I think a lot of uh, young talents uh, do find it quite overwhelming and quite unachievable, you know, looking at certain structures of how the industry is, let's say. Um, so I want to start with something that seems to have been a topic on both of the episodes we've done so far, which is the idea of mm -hmm. mentorships. Um, if you mm -hmm. have any particular feelings on, you know, on that or the best way for people listening to find themselves a mentor or to reach out to the community that already exists and get themselves stuck in. I subscribe to the idea of mentorship. I do think it's a good thing, but I feel like I'm kind of alone in this view that I have of mentorship alone is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more of a fan of sponsorship, actually. Okay. So mentorship is like someone who teaches you skills and like, hey, go mm -hmm. learn this thing. Or, you know, I had a mentor who taught me technical program management when I was on policy and enforcement. And they said, hey, go learn UML project management language, because that's what will help you with your devs, which helped immensely. Mm -hmm. But a sponsor will actually speak up for you when you're not in the room. So That's for example, when I got the Special Olympics eSports tournament, it's because somebody spoke up and said, hey, Jen had just done an eSports tournament with you know, the Give campaign. Let her run with this and see what happens. And mm -hmm. that's largely how that rule happened. But you, you have to have someone who can kind of vouch for you, know your skills, know what you're interested in. I, at any point in time, will have two or three sponsors. And sometimes it's a yes and. Sometimes my mentors are my sponsors. If you can hear that grunting, my dog is clearly upset with me. I don't I know like, what I, I did. I thought that was like a car outside the window or something. Nope, that is my dog. He is very loud and he just lays right here. So thanks, bud. That's the cameo I was um, waiting for, I guess, even if it was just audible. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's got some opinions. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I would say sponsorship in my history has been a lot more not impactful maybe the wrong word but it has been very useful and very um important for me getting where i'm at you know it's i i look up to i work with a lot of empowered women i myself and now am an empowered woman and i feel like my responsibility and my joy and my my passion now is to empower other women mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So industry. like a way, a way I always put it, and I, I, apologies if anyone listens to all of these episodes in one go, I feel like I repeat this sort of metaphor a few times. But for me, I think the best thing to do instead of just opening doors for other people in the industry, but is, is people like yourself and people who are in really senior positions to sort of extend the ladder down and pull people up with you and say, no, 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 we're going up. We're taking your ideas with me. There is areas up here that you are unable to access, but I want your thoughts to be present in this room. And that sort of sounds similar to what you're saying with sponsorships, right? Is, is being mm -hmm. aware that there are people who don't have the same access as you speaking on their behalf to get them the things that they need. And you know that they're really good at. Absolutely. Or even kind of pushing them in some skills. Like I have two mentees who I kind of act as sponsors for as well. And mm -hmm. I, I love both of them so dearly. But, you know, I was presenting to the Xbox MVPs last Friday. And so one of my mentees is like, hey, this would be really good for you mm -hmm. to get some kind of speaking engagements outside the company. Um, why don't you go try this? And of course, um, 
the person was super nervous. And then at the end of it, like, oh, this was amazing. I was like, oh, I know, I told you. <laughs> um, but just getting people to do, and then one of my other mentees, um, just getting her visibility, like when I go present to a director or someone, and it's a program that she's largely driving for the social good. I'm like, hey, do you want to go present this? Mm -hmm. And because, like, you know, these people have seen my face a lot. <laughs> and while I love talking to these people, and I love catching up with these people, and I love brainstorming with these people, I want to give other folks kind of the opportunities that I have had mm -hmm. and the visibility that I have had. And so bringing everyone along with me, I think is probably one of my favorite things. Yeah. And I think uh, very similar to this as well, which some people might, some people might be thinking, well, it's tough, you know, to get in touch with people. And at this point, I think it's really key to point out that both me and you had similar starters coming into this industry in that we didn't really know anyone. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on you know, there's two ways in. One of them is knowing people when they bring you along with them, but then what it's like to actually join an industry where you don't know anyone and you need to forge your path and find your peers within it. Yeah, I actually found my my first job for Xbox on Reddit. <laughs> like somebody had posted the job posting on Reddit and I, I flipped through Reddit pretty frequently. I was like, this sounds pretty cool. Let me mm -hmm. go try this. And then it ended up being Xbox. Um, and it was for a different role, actually. And they're like, hey, we we think you'd be better in this role at Xbox. And I was like, cool, if it's Xbox, sign me up. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I was at a point in time where, again, I was at Amazon, but I was like, I want to go work in video games. Like, video games have been important to me. There's a lot I can do in video games. I'm passionate about it. And so uh, I was fortunate that I found that on Reddit. But I mean, I don't know that I knew what a program manager was mm -hmm. until I was at Amazon. Um, you know, I was in college, I was working two jobs. I was a linguistics major. I never interned anywhere. I didn't know that was a thing you were supposed to do. Um, I was working two jobs over the summers just to kind of have spending money while I was uh, at class. Oh my God, he is scratching everything <laughs> down there. He's scratching the ground. <laughs> Does, he, does Here, he have anything on. to say? Are you okay, bud? Yeah, are you? Blink once if you're okay. Here. Here, can you go do something productive? <laughs> or or not? Okay. Oh. I don't know if he... Hi. Nope, he's going back in. Nope. Okay. Okay, okay that's We're just fine. Gonna, there's his little nose. Little that's snoot. what you got. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Mwah. Here, go. Um, And he's going to go back under. This is my life. Amazing. Um, what a life. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, so I didn't know what a program manager was until I worked at Amazon. And I was mm -hmm. like, what does this person do? I'm like, they're a professional organizer. Oh my God, I can do that. Um, and I kind of learned everything on the fly. Like, mm -hmm. I, I wish I had known about this stuff ahead of time, but I think I, not to say I'm a testament to, but you don't have to have everything figured out. You know, when I graduated college, I didn't know what I wanted to do still. Mm -hmm. um, so I took a year off to rescue German Shepherds. Um, cause I had always thought the breed was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I always thought they got kind of a bad rap and having had several German shepherds, you know, in and out of my house, either fostering or I've had two that it, it stands to reason. Like they're all big chickens. They're all huge chickens. Like you can train them, but at the core, they're chickens. I mean, he, the one you just saw, he has a security Frisbee that he walks around the house with. <laughs> it's pretty cute. I do love it. That's adorable. But yeah, it, so you don't, there's no perfect path into gaming. And there's mm -hmm. so many different roles in gaming, whether it's in game dev, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in engineering on the platform, artists, like, I don't subscribe to STEM, actually. I subscribe to Steam, because mm -hmm. I think there's a huge, huge piece missing with that, the A, which stands for art. Okay. Because you have, you know, music in itself is an art. You have all the different like narrative design, you have level design, character design, all of that is pure art. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm sorry. I, I just got lost in a moment then. I'm just like, my God, you are just <laughs> so cool. Okay, so one thing I do <laughs> want to pick there though, it, it sounds very much like you're just saying, and I completely prescribe to this idea of just throwing yourself into what you love. There is no boundaries to what you are passionate about. And if you are interested in pursuing mm -hmm. something, do it. Don't let, like, to, to quote RuPaul, don't let your inner saboteur get in the way, right? So I'm in, on this point, I want to directly call out another sort of semi-random thing you seem to have done in your role, because I'm assuming this is something you're equally as passionate about. Jen, tell me about the ducklings. 
So um, <laughs> on Microsoft campus, there yes. we humans built these fountains, right? And if you have wings that work, like an adult duck, you can fly in and out of them. If you are a brand new baby duckling and you get in there and you can't get out, uh, you you don't you don't get out. Oh, and so the, there again, was... anyone listening to the audio version, YouTube right now, look at these little ramps for the ducks. Oh my God. We, we had this issue, like that mama duck, she had eight ducklings and she put them in the fountain, but the, the gap between the water and the edge was probably like six inches. And they're teeny tiny fresh babies, like they can't get out. And what happens is if they can't get out and regulate the oil in their feathers, they don't get out. And so what we did is, it was hilarious throughout the day there were different iterations of like what a duck exit would look like and some people brought chairs rocks to kind of weigh stuff down um it was in like trays like it was there were several iterations of this and um facilities was like hey you can't put anything non-approved in there i was like i'm not gonna let these ducklings die like that's not gonna happen on my watch <laughs> it's just not gonna happen and i remember writing this mail I think they could just smell the crazy. I'm not even joking. <laughs> it was two woman. <laughs> full. It was two full word pages, like long. Uh -huh. I cited migratory bird legislation acts, the facts that ducks are protected. I cited a recent article from Nature that ducks have feelings. It was <laughs> you this long these mail. ramps into place. <laughs> Kind of, I did. And so I remember I was out there, like I had my laptop and I was working and these two facilities people come back and I'm like, uh oh. So I was like, hi, may I help you? And they're like, we were sent to check on the welfare of some ducklings. And I'm like, oh my God, yes, I did something and it worked. And so, but it, then all of that aside, like what had happened, like we had like a chair and a tray and something, it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so I remember going to the local hardware store like 15 minutes away. And when I got there, I realized I had forgotten my wallet. And so I went to the guys back in the, in the, um, in the hardware section with uh -huh. the, the lumber. And I was like, listen, this is going to sound really weird. There are some ducklings. They are stuck in a fountain. They are going to die. If we don't put a ramp in, I have no money on me. What do I do? And they're like, we have scrap lumber. Please go take it and go. And I'm like, how do I pay? And they're like, don't go save the ducklings. Oh my god, by the way, a much more clever, right, I just said the word clever, a cleverer person than I can piece together a metaphor here about the duckling ramps and helping women and non-binary individual and trans women and people of colour into the industry. I'm just putting it out there, there is 100% a metaphor that Jen, you have perfectly set up. Are you happy with that? It's about accessibility. <laughs> and we made these fountains inaccessible. And so the ramps that you see there were actually the second year's iteration. I went to facilities as like, hey, like I will put these boards in every year or can we do something more permanent? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, really? <laughs> like this, the whole, if I can give people one piece of advice, it's just ask. If you want something, just ask. The worst that's going to happen is someone says no. So I remember asking about this and they they went to they went to Lowe's, they went and got like treks, like waterproof wood and mm -hmm. built these custom ramps. Like I remember going out and seeing the the prototypes for them. And it was just amazing to see like somebody had actually spent time on their weekend. Uh, actually, they didn't even, this was a, an official thing, so it wasn't even on the weekend. But they're like, yeah, we we got a We got a request. Amazing. We realized this is a nice thing to do. And uh, yeah, so now there are permanently installed duckling ramps at the Microsoft campus. And there's a little sign next to all of them that says like, if you see ducklings, please guide them to the ramps. Um, and if you want to learn more, me and this woman, um, Susan, uh, manage this. <laughs> we manage this alias at Microsoft where it's wildlife on campus. Oh, and gorgeous. in the before times, it was people who were like, I'm at building 30 and here's a deer. And now at the pet with the pandemic, everyone's like, here's bunnies outside my house. Here's a bobcat outside my house. Oh. Like it's so fun. And it there's just so much positive like reception to it. People are like, oh, this is so great. Thank you for sharing. Oh, Jen. Like right. I've shared my crows. I just I can't. I'm 
<sighs> I'm getting too emotionally invested in these ducklings, so I think I'm gonna have to draw a line in the sand and say, you know what? We might need to do a whole other episode just on you and these ducklings. Um, but thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I promise you from all the listeners as well, from me and the ducklings uh, for joining me today. I feel like we can talk for absolutely ever, but I will point out at this moment as we are wrapping up the podcast, it's worth adding that tomorrow you are gonna be on a Minecraft Twitch stream for Earth Day with Lucas Chopper. Do you want to give us a little bit of a heads up of what that is if people are interested and want to go check it out? Yeah, so we will be playing Minecraft and we'll be talking about Microsoft's commitments to sustainability and what that means for the business. And Lucas Chopper, he is the chief environmental officer of Microsoft. So I'm excited to talk with him. I'm excited to learn from him. It's going to be amazing. It sounds so good. I'm definitely going to be in chat hyping you up, asking you to find, I don't know, put some ducks in the game or something. Anyway, that was ridiculous. Before you go, though, as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, we asked you a question from the lovely Lydia Winters. We would like you to give a question to our next guest. Now, I'm not going to tell you who that guest is, but you can okay. ask the most seemingly ridiculous or the most wonderfully simple question in the world. Do you know what that question is? I think, I mean, I want to focus more on gaming. I think I'll go pretty easy. I will not ask. I'll ask a softball okay. question. But, you know, what was the moment you knew gaming was the career you wanted to pursue? I think that's always a really interesting question to get to basically everyone of, you know, growing up, video gaming was not, it wasn't the cool thing like it is now. There were no esports scholarships. There's, there's nothing. And so for most of us that are in the industry now, we had to fight through being the nerds. And so what was that moment? I think it'd be interesting. And let me tell you for a solid fact, knowing who I know is on the next episode, that is gonna be a fantastic answer. So excellent choice as always. Thanks again for joining me and everyone at home. If you're watching on the Microsoft UK YouTube channel or listening over on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple or Google Podcasts, you can find us absolutely anywhere. Just look for Women of Xbox UK, UK Podcast. It'd be great if I got the name right. And uh, I guess I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks again, Jen. And I will see you all again soon. Bye-bye.